Okay, everyone, welcome back to part three. Uh, at this point, you should have a general idea of what you want your talk to look like in terms of the content and um, what sort of analogies you might use. So now it's time to start talking and thinking about a slide because a slide is going to be a critical determinant for which direction your presentation goes. Um, a very chaotic, involved slide with a lot of data can end up being maybe a distraction and can bring your presentation down from a viewer standpoint whereas a very clean, um, helpful slide can really bring your uh, presentation to the next level and, and provide a lot of aid for the viewer to better understand the concept. So let's talk about what makes a slide good or bad. The first point, which is very counterintuitive to everything you've ever heard before about a scientific presentation is to not show data. And yes, I said it, every presentation you've ever given in the context of science has probably, probably been built around data, that all that the viewers really want to see are the data that you have, and especially if it's like a PhD committee or something like that. Um, so we're used to presenting data and showing it and, and working our, our presentations around it. But in this case, we want to actually completely exclude it because it can be just confusing. And frankly, most people don't understand um, how to read scientific graphs. They don't necessarily know that a single asterisk floating above the graph is means that it's statistically significant and that two or three are better than one. Um, you know, most people sure can probably look and say, okay, in a bar graph, this bar is higher than this bar. But um, you can also just make a graph if you wanted to. You can make a fake graph with two bars showing one over the other, get all the stuff off the X and the Y axis, get the statistics, uh, statistic significance indicators out of there, and just stick to the very basics because um, you're probably introducing more variables that your audience doesn't necessarily know how to interpret. So no data. And what you really want to show is whatever will be necessary to aid the viewer's understanding. Um, in a moment, I'm going to show you my presentation, a few examples, a few iterations of the, the PowerPoint slide I used. Um, and you'll notice that throughout that, I, I had to address this decision of, do I show a synapse or do I show a traffic light? Um, given everything I've described about my presentation. So take a second and think about that. Ask yourself, what do you think I should show, a synapse or a traffic light? The answer will be coming soon. Um, but actually, I have to tell you the answer right now. So in this case, like thinking about the, the concept of what is necessary to aid the viewer's understanding, is a traffic light going to aid the viewer's understanding? It might help them adhere to the message. It might bring them into it and say, okay, yes, I, that's right. There's a traffic light involved, but it's not going to teach them anything. A synapse, on the other hand, will show them, this is what I'm talking about. This is what a, you know, we're analogizing to a traffic light. So in my case, I found that showing a synapse was the smart move, um, or at least I thought it was the wise move. And uh, so you'll see my slide in a minute, but you need to ask yourself what will be confusing. Um, what about the words that I'm speaking are confusing and how can showing an image on the screen make them less confusing? How can you kind of handhold the audience through the more complicated parts? So that's exactly what, what I'm getting at here is if you can find and address the points in the presentation where your audience may get lost in the complexities of the, of the research that you're describing, that is a good point to address with your slide. Um, but generally, a lot of people use um, like, imagery that are sort of like analogies in their slides. Um, and that would I would encourage that to be at the center of yours. It's like, let's say you're making an analogy about, um, you know, traffic lights and synapses, then I would make I would make that that is the main image. Like there's a traffic light and there's a synapse and there's maybe an equal sign. Um, and you'll see my slide in a minute with, with what I did, but you want them to be focused on, on the overall like analogy that you're building around. And then if you can include other points, um, little like, arrows and things like that. If there's like a, a continuation where someone needs to understand that this variable affects this variable, having things like that on screen in a subtle way um, can be very helpful as well. So you don't wanna distract the audience. The slide is there as a reference, not as a roadmap. Uh, when I first showed up to my audition for the three minute thesis, I basically showed up with a slide that was the equivalent to like a scientific poster you might give at a conference. It had all my data, and, you know, if you've ever done a, a poster presentation, you sort of start in the top left with the, you know, figure one, and then you move down or you move to the right. And you kind of like walk through and there's like a, there's a physical spacing to going through the story. 
I did the same thing on my slide and the committee basically said, you got to change something because this is not going to be good at all. Um, so you, you're not trying to necessarily, you know, it's not a roadmap. You don't want them to like, okay, you don't want them to show up thinking I need to follow the top left of the screen and then the middle left or the, the middle top and then the middle or the top right. You don't want them to be following the whole thing. You want their eyes on you. So you want the slide instead to be a reference that if they get confused, they can look up, look at the slide, and it'll be a reminder of the things that you're trying to explain instead of something that they have to focus on the whole time. Because if you can have their eyes on you, that's that's going to enhance their um, adherence to the message. They're, they're going to understand a lot more of what you're expressing. So this is a fake slide made by the three minute the, the official three minute thesis um, to demonstrate what you should not be going for with your slides. Clearly, there's a lot going on here. Um, I'm not going to go through one by one and you know point out, but there are multiple charts. There are a lot of words. Um, there's you know there's this alarmed emoji face in the bottom. There's just a lot here that can draw your eye and confuse someone. And so what you don't want is your audience looking at this and trying to figure it out and you know trying to read the quote and trying to read okay what is the what are the axes on this chart because the more time that the audience is spending trying to decipher what's on your slide, they are not fully cognitively attending to what you're describing. And, um, and so you're gonna lose them. And the key thing is just holding their attention throughout the entire thing. Because when you have such a short presentation, it's so important that the audience understands every word. Um, and if they get lost at some point, it's gonna be hard to get them back. So you wanna avoid something like this. You wanna go for something more simple. So let's look at my second iteration. This is an actual slide. Uh, this has not been shown to the world. Um, this is the actual slide that I that I started with um, when I was doing my three minute thesis. Not the one that I just described where I showed all the data, but after I realized, okay, I can't be showing all my data, I tried to create something else. And this is almost, in my opinion, just as bad. I'm being critical of myself here, um, but there's there's just a lot going on. I mean, I'm looking at this right now and my eyes are darting all over the place and I'm trying to figure out like, where do I start? Okay, let's say I start in the top left um, and I move to the top middle and then to the top right. You know, that's what I was going for is to, you know, follow along, but you don't want the audience trying to think like, okay, what is it? What are they saying right now? They're talking about a mouse genes. Where are we on here? Um, oh, okay. We're in the top middle. Maybe they'll figure that out, but you don't want them to be super distracted by what's on the slides. Um, what I was really going for, and you can probably tell, is I was just looking to have an image on the screen that's representative of every piece of information I was giving. So first, I was talking about this genetic mutation, 16p11.2 duplication. There it is in the top left. And then we changed this gene in a mouse. There it is in the top middle. And we wanted to know what's happening in the brain. And there's the image associated with that in the top right. I don't think any of these images are necessarily required for the audience to understand what I just said, but um, especially not the top right, like what's happening in the brain. We don't need a brain and a question mark. Um, it's a very obvious image. When you see it, you know what the, what the message is, the brain with the question mark, but it doesn't actually convey any like information that they wouldn't already be grasping. So now let's move on to the middle part where there's a bunch of traffic lights and there's a whole lot going on. This is exactly what I was describing. This is a roadmap. We don't want a roadmap. Um, what we want is something very simple. So I'm hopefully I've conveyed the point that of what's wrong with this. Um, but now I'm going to move on to the next iteration of my slide, which is much simpler. So then we had this. Um, one potential indicator of a good slide for a three minute thesis is that there's a lot of white space. Um, this is not white space, but you know, there's empty space. Uh, this is just my opinion, but I believe that the fewer objects that are on screen, the better. And then you make the most of the objects. You have to think about your slide similar to how you're thinking about your, your presentation itself. I mean, you only have so much time. You only have so many words to speak and to convey what you're going for. You only have so much space on the screen and you don't want to fill all that space with complex imagery. You want to fill it with things that are simple and direct and obvious. Um, so in this case, 
I put a very big synapse on the left side of the screen, as I was describing earlier, because I feel that it's important for if we're gonna be talking about synapses, the audience should have some idea of what the heck a synapse looks like, because without that image, they're probably gonna picture something in their head, which maybe isn't accurate, um, but also, it takes a lot of the cognitive work away from the, from the viewer. You know, if, if I'm talking about a synapse and they're thinking, I've never heard that word before, I wonder what that means. And they're starting to picture it in their head and they're thinking about it and how does it work? Well, it's interesting. Or maybe they think, oh, it's boring. Either way, whatever's going on in their head is taking their attention away from me. So putting a synapse on the screen and making it clear um, saves that, that attention and leaves it to me. And I actually, in my presentation, I say, this is a synapse on the left side of the screen. I actually said that in my presentation. So they had, you know, the, the three seconds of me saying that to attend to that. And then I brought them back and I continued my presentation. Um, now, on the right, what's what I'm going for is, you know, this like walkthrough of like, okay, NPAS for builds GABA synapses. I'm starting at the top. And GABA synapses are like red lights. And the red lights now going down are like the brain's balance. They balance out the brain. And this balance is important for sociability, which you see on the bottom. Um, but I didn't really think that that was, I thought that was a little bit too much. So I ended up simplifying to just this right here, that at the very top, we have MPAS4, which builds GABA synapses, which are red lights, which have some relationship to sociability. And now this slide, I hope if someone were to look at it without knowing about my presentation, they would at least have some idea of what it means. Because, you know, not, of course they wouldn't get the whole thing, but they would have a general idea instead of just like this right here. They would have absolutely, I mean, this is so much, so much going on. It's not intuitive. It's not very clear. Um, where this, I hope that by itself, it could stand alone and have some sort of meaning. But <clears throat> um, the other thing that's important to note here is, like I said, your, your slide should be a reference, not a guide. Um, while this is sort of a guide and that you have like MPAS4 is step one, then the down arrow, GABA, that's step two, the socializing, that's step three. Um, it's more of a reference where I knew that I was going to have to explain NPAS4 builds GABA synapses, which and GABA synapses are like red lights. There is a, if the audience gets lost, there is a clear uh, depiction of that in the top right corner of my screens, NPAS4 with an arrow and the GABA, and that's a red light. So I just wanted to have this as a reference. Um, throughout my talk, and I thought that it would be uh, hopefully a clear and effective way to at least provide that reference for my audience if they got lost in, in everything that I was saying. So now I actually want to show one other example. Um, this is a slide from a friend of mine uh, who competed in at University of Buffalo, where I did my competition as well, or I competed as well. Um, and I think this slide is awesome. I, I really love it. I think that she did a really great job of like building a compelling image with this slide. I think when you look at this, you're automatically intrigued. You think, okay, this is ring of fire. I wonder what that means. You know, there's this, there's clearly a relationship again. She's like showing that immune cells and microbes have this, you know, bilateral relationship um, similar to what I did where there's arrows I, and just another side side point, whenever there's relationships like that, I think that it's important to have some arrows like that so the audience can can see it and, re, and uh, have that reference. But then on the left side, you have health. On the right side, you have gum disease. What's happening here? You know, clearly there's a message that is paired with this. Um, and learning that message seems intriguing to me. I, I like the imagery and I want to know what it means. And I feel like I already have some sense of it. But um, I'm just like a sm small explanation away from it. And I think that is an important note is that you, your slide by itself doesn't have to tell the whole story. Um, it shouldn't tell the whole story. That's what you're there for. You're there to talk about it and explain everything. But the slide is a reference. And in this case, once again, it's clearly a reference. And she probably had a, an analogy for the ring of fire, whatever that is. But um, I just I, I think this is such a great slide. And, and I think it's another good example of how you can keep things simple and exciting while still providing value for your presentation. So overall, be simple, um, be thoughtful. And if you, if you have like some sort of design skills that you can apply and make a cool, like a nice looking slide like this, go for it. So some other key tips, um, 
just in general, of course, you want to start with the script and you want to avoid jargon. Just like you're going to sit and carefully make your PowerPoint slide and make sure that everything on there is helpful and meaningful and clear, you want to do the exact same with your with your pitch. Um, I actually memorized my pitch. I'm sure most people do. I think that some people get like a general idea of like, this is what I want to talk about. And then they go up and just speak for the three minutes. Um, personally, I wrote a script and I strongly recommend it. The The reason for that is because it allows you to consider timing in that you can read your script. Like you can write your script and say, this is what I want to say. And you can start a timer and you can read it out loud at the pace that seems right. And then stop the timer and see, am I over three minutes? Am I under three minutes? Um, and you can do all that before you start to really memorize everything. The other thing is when you're just sort of freestyling it, if you go on stage and you say, these are the main points, here, three minutes starts now, let's go. And you just talk, um, you're probably more likely to include jargon. Whereas when you make a script and you specify every single word, you can, you have all the time in the world to think about, okay, I'm used to saying this word in my scientific presentations, I always describe it as this word that's maybe a scientific jargon word, but I need to find the right way to, to replace that word, the right way to explain that quickly. You have all the time in the world to think about that, think about the right phrasing, and then choose whatever you're gonna put, put it in your script, and then um, use that. And so I just think uh, I've seen people you know, freestyle and um, having the control over over exactly what words you use and the exact cadence of them and everything overall comes out with a much more clean presentation that's also more direct and um and clear because you you're you're spending weeks choosing exactly what words you're going to use rather than making them up in the moment so of course start by laying the foundation i think the very best three minute thesis presentations start by explaining the why of what's what's the pur purpose you know why does this matter to humanity or to a certain population or to a certain geographical region. Um, laying the necessary context and rationale will always make your presentation more impactful because if the people who are watching you talk understand that this has real impact, um, then they're gonna be more engaged and it's gonna, it's gonna resonate with them more and they'll probably remember your presentation for longer. You can tell a story. Um, I've seen people do this. I've seen a, a great presentation where, um, the presenter started off by saying, imagine you're in this situation and you get this news. How would you feel? Well, this is the type of you know um, news that many, many people get in this situation and there's no way to, to mitigate it. So that's my research is now looking for a way to address this, um, that type of thing. If you can, if you can get the, engage, the uh, viewer engaged in a story, you're, you're, gonna be, you're gonna get some points because of course everyone knows telling a story is a great way to go if you wanna make people excited about something. As I mentioned, abandon the norms of academic presentations. Um, it's tough, but you have to learn, you know, no data, no complex jargon, certainly very little nuance. Of course, you know, we're used to saying, here's a figure, but, you know, keep in mind, you know, uh, interpret this with caution. We've only run this in one experiment. We have to replicate it, blah, blah, blah. All those things where there's all these, these important add-ons you need to get used to just taking those things out and simplifying it uh, as, as concisely as possible. Practice is key. Of course, if you're gonna be memorizing your entire script, obviously um, using a, uh, or rehearsing is going to be extremely important. The more practice you can get, the better. I practiced my script so many times that I could probably do it right now. And that was about two years ago. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, you get used to going through it and, uh, when you practice also, keep in mind using a range of audiences. So practicing by yourself is good for memorizing the, the presentation, but if you present your, your through and thesis in front of your friends um, and your family, colleagues, grandparents, all different people, they're gonna be able to provide you a range of important insights. So your friends might say, I didn't really get this, and your friends might say the same, or your family might say the same. Your colleagues might say, okay, you know, maybe you oversimplified that thing, or here's another analogy that might work. And of course, your grandparents are just going to smile and be proud of you. But it's always good to, uh, to see if they have any input as well. I just think that getting diverse input um, is helpful 
from for people with varying levels of expertise in your field and just in the research in general. Now, here's another thing. I strongly recommend recording yourself, videotaping, videotaping or audio recording yourself. Um, you will discover that you do some funky things potentially, maybe you won't, but I had a video of myself talking and I watched it back and I was like, what am I doing with my body? <laughs> I think you have to realize the the physical presentation must complement the vocal presentation. And so for example, um, you know, you, you might get awkward on stage and you might do some, you might gesture at the wrong time, uh, things like that, that just watching yourself move as you present will be helpful for identifying. And also your tone. I think tone can be a powerful tool for conveying information. If you want the audience to get excited about a certain part of the presentation, or it's like clearly the most exciting finding, you should, your tone should reflect that. You should be excited about it and you should be uh, it should be a robust part of the presentation. So watch yourself, listen to yourself and see um, how you feel about it. Cause that, that can also really enhance your presentation. I think we've all seen a really confident, comfortable speaker versus a really, you know, uncomfortable, shaky, nervous person giving a presentation. And there's just something about the first, the first type of person that um, makes the message more gripping. I think it, for me, I actually feel sympathy for the person who is, you know, looks nervous. I feel bad for them. I think, oh man, I wish I could help this person out. Um, give them a hug or something or clap for them. You know, it's like, you're doing good. And, and that distracts me from the presentation. So, and also information always seems more believable when it's coming from someone confident. So with all that said, be confident. You are the world's leading expert on your research. This is absolutely the truth. Nobody knows your research better than you. And I think this takes a long time to learn, but you know, you've been, you've been leading this project. You've been doing the background research. Um, you know, the, the ins and outs of this, you know, what, what experiments maybe you ran and you didn't include because they didn't work. You've had all sorts of nights spent up thinking about this. You know more about this than everyone. And you should be confident about it because um, I guarantee you're a, you far exceed the expertise of everyone in the audience when it comes to exactly what you're talking about. And this is just a general good note to know um, when you're giving any presentation about your research, be confident because you are the master of it. So with all that said, um, I'll see you in the next part where we're going to start talking about social media.